almost everything we know about the universe and what's out there is because we can study the light that arrives here on Earth. So we need to understand light. We need to understand the tools that we build to study the light. Uh, we need to understand in general, more general, the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which is all light to an astronomer, but uh, that may be a new concept. So we'll have a look at this. So everybody has an everyday concept of what light is. It's what our eyes detect. But light's just one part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And we refer to it casually as electromagnetic radiation. But there are other forms of radiation in common usage. And uh, you've got to be careful with your audiences. You say electromagnetic radiation, they think uranium or <laughs> strontium-90 or something like this, and they get the wrong idea. But astronomy is different from most other sciences in the sense that we can't go into a laboratory and study some object there. You know, a physicist or a chemist, they can mix chemicals, they can perform an experiment in the laboratory and make measurements on real stuff to figure out how it works. We can't. We can't go to stars, galaxies. We can't put them in the laboratory. What we can do is look at them. And in a, in a way, it's kind of strange. Um, astronomers are the ultimate peeping toms. All we do is sit there and watch. We don't actually engage with what we study. We just watch it. So we need to understand light. And there are various ways of understanding light. And uh, one way is as a wave. So a wave, it's like ocean waves, stuff that comes in. But there are a lot of different kinds of waves, sound waves. A light wave is an oscillating electromagnetic field. And it's got properties of waves. This is something that comes up in physics over and over and over again. It turns out matter has wave-like properties too. Everything can be treated as a wave in some sense. Waves are some kind of oscillation. They have a wavelength. That is a physical distance between crests or dips in the wave. And in astronomy, we usually use the Greek letter lambda. It's very common. You'll see plots everywhere with lambda. This is something, if you're trying to engage with the public, this is a hard thing to do. You can't tell the public, oh, just look at lambda. But that's what astronomers would say to each other. Uh, you know, plot lambda versus flux. Well, it's wavelength. Waves travel, propagate in some direction with some speed. That's some wavelength. Um, and speed of light, astronomers always use C for the speed of light. Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared. C in physics. Astrophysics is always the speed of light. And it's uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. That number's a lot easier to remember in kilometers. I, it's 186,000 uh, miles per second. 186 is harder to remember than 300. I like 300 or 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, if we have a speed and a wavelength, that's going to determine a frequency of oscillation. Because you can sit at some location and you can watch that disturbance cross that location. And so given the wavelength and given the speed, you can determine a frequency. There's a relationship between those three numbers, the speed of the wave, the frequency of the wave, and the wavelength. That frequency, usually we use the Greek letter nu, uh, seeds, the textbook uses F for frequency. Uh, that frequency is just the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So some te technical abstract details about light as a wave, but these are critical to astronomers. We need to know these properties, uh, the speed, wavelength, and frequency in order to study and understand the light 
we receive from distant objects. That wavelength is equivalent to the color of light, at least in the visible that we perceive. So it's not just some completely abstract thing. You change that wavelength, our eyes, our brains are designed to distinguish wavelength. We measure wavelength with our eyes. And we do it by seeing different colors. You can take what we call a dispersive element, fancy technical term for something like a prism. Uh, another very common, much more common than a prism these days is if you look at a CD or a DVD, you catch it in the light, you see little rainbows. It's dispersing the light the same way, separating white light into its colors. Now, if you combine all these colors, you may have seen this on a color wheel. White light, when you see color white, you're just seeing all the colors together simultaneously, and that's how your brain interprets seeing all that together. And, and that's actually an important point. There are a lot of technical details like this I'm going to go through and talk about the instruments and how we make measurements and be very quantitative about studying light. But a lot of times when you're writing and trying to communicate with audiences, again, the numbers, plots, graphs, these are ways of effectively communicating with other scientists, but not very effective ways of communicating with the general public. And moreover, if you've got a character who maybe doesn't have any fancy tricorders, they've got their eyeballs, you need to know what they're looking at, how it's going to be perceived. Uh, one of the things I might talk about later this afternoon, uh, I had a big set of blog posts last year. One of the previous Launchpad uh, attendees wrote a story for Strange Horizons. It took place on the surface of a planet around a uh, M dwarf, a red dwarf star. And she was like, well, well she, she wanted specific color vegetation or something. How would things look in general? And uh, Jerry Olteen and I first uh, both said, well, those stars are really red. You're going to get like red lights. And uh, it's going to look kind of funky. You won't, have, uh, you won't have blue light or maybe uh, not much of it. So the colors are going to look strange to you. But uh, then somebody rightly pointed out a fact that I remembered. Uh, most uh, light bulbs operate at the same temperatures, put out the same spectrum as red dwarf stars. But they look white. It doesn't look red. However, I know from looking through telescopes at some of these cool stars, they look red. So how do you resolve this? Uh, so that white looks like white instead of red or blue or incredibly yellow, really bad things for skin tones. And, and this is the same kind of problem in, in astronomy. Um, as we'll see, we, uh, we use very uh, specific, specific kind of scientific instruments that are designed to capture the most information. They're not designed uh, to provide real pictures. We have to do a lot of processing to create something that's similar to what you might see, except you could never see it because you don't have the perceptive tools to see it. You can't collect that much light in your eyes and so forth. Um, but the resolution to this problem, I, I think, is the intensity of the light. If you have a very faint light that's uh, got a lot of red light and not very much blue, you're going to see the red. But if you crank that whole spectrum up, so it's got a lot, still has a lot more red light than blue light, but it's also got a lot of blue light at that point. You perceive it as, uh, as white. So you can know the spectrum, but you've got to do some thinking about how your brain's going to perceive it. So biology plays into this as well. So you can't talk about what does something look like. I can't tell you necessarily without understanding biology and human perception. I can tell you what the spectrum looks like, but I can't tell you necessarily how somebody's going to perceive it without a lot more work.
So, so that's sort of a guess, is a best guess as to why the other colored stars might still appear white. Yeah, um, it depends on on how intense that light is. So I ran more numbers. This is maybe getting ahead. Maybe I'll, I'll talk about it or maybe not, depending on interest level. Uh, trying to determine that star for a planet at the right temperatures, the right distance, what that star would look like, how much bigger it would look like compared to the sun. It looks a little bigger. And how we would perceive it. And I found an analog in our own sun towards sunset. Uh, dust in our atmosphere reddens the spectrum of the sun. The sun looks more or less white, maybe a little yellowish, whitish. Um, but when you look through the dust in the atmosphere as it sets, it clearly looks red, right? Because the uh, light isn't that intense coming from it at that point. It's got a lot of, uh, a lot of the photons scattered out. I'm starting to get technical here, but... Uh, but isn't that... <coughs> and it's mostly the blue light that's scattered? That's why the sky is blue. Now, uh, I determined that probably this M star from that planet was going to look like the sun at a p particular position of sunset. And uh, so you would still have some bluish skies and you would have this, this sort of red light. It would be a little bit different quality to the light, um, but, but that analog of the setting sun I think was the closest to, to, get, it, to get it right, to get the right uh, intensity level and, and appearance in the sky. But it took a lot more work than, here's the spectrum of this star. This is what it looks like. This is what it would be like. It was, uh, I had to take two rounds at it, so it was tricky. Would planets on a planet that had a red dwarf star still have green coloring because of the, I mean, wouldn't their photosynthesis be a little different? Since they um, it depends. There are multiple chemicals that uh, can be used for photosynthesis, and some of them are not green. So okay. that's right. So you can have different colors, and I don't know how they would compete necessarily. Rob Sawyer, how would your cousins see light like that? <laughs> My cousins are colorblind, red, green, colorblind. Ah. Uh, so they would think that they were, see, it's brown. It's all brown to them. Imagine the idea of brown light, which is an interesting yeah. notion, right? But red and green look brown to them. <laughs> well, even on Earth, not everything that photosynthesizes in green. Right. Scarlet maples. This, is, this was her point, uh, and I don't think it carried to the back of the room. <laughs> but uh, excellent point made twice. OK. This is an example I use uh, with my non-majors. And thank God they still know who Pink Floyd is. <laughs> I keep thinking one of these years I'm going to say, do you guys know Pink Floyd? And they're just going to stare at me. <laughs> but at least uh, up until a couple of years ago, they were still raising their hands and enjoying the music. So again, you try to find ways to relate stuff to what people have experienced. And one thing that a lot of people have seen either on t-shirts, I guess even CD cases aren't that common anymore, is the cover of Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon. We talked about this misconception about the dark side of the moon. I think they're to blame. Uh, they've got more problems here in their prism. <laughs> so maybe this is something an uh, astronomer gets picky about. Uh, but light doesn't get dispersed quite like this. They've also got pink in their spectrum. I think that's, yeah. I can understand that, artistic license. Pink Floyd's got pink in their spectrum. And my apologies, this is a little washed out compared to the graphics I can see on the computer. Well, what's wrong with the picture? And, and here we've got the back where the spectrum uh, is reassembled by the prism <laughs> coming back in. Um, this violates various laws of physics, too. <laughs> so we have these primary colors in a real spectrum. Uh, Roy G. Biv is the mnemonic used. Red, orange, yellow, uh, green. green, blue, indigo, violet. I can't tell the difference between indigo and violet and uh, stuff like that. Um, I've read yes. a fascinating piece about that because there are seven colors in the spectrum and Newton himself couldn't really tell the difference between indigo and violet, but he felt there should be a prime number of colors that God would have done it that way. Newton was 
mystical, spiritual. Yeah. He died a virgin, happily, <laughs> proudly. Let that be a lesson to you. That's right. <laughs> Not all uh, astronomers or physicists are quite so proud. Um, and, Which is uh, why there still are astronomers. Yes, yes. <laughs> And, and moreover, he uh, spent a lot of time on alchemy. He, uh, so there are some strange things historically like this. Uh, and now we have Broji Biv, which I guess is a better mnemonic than, how do you say it? Biv? You'd say Biv anyway, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. Or maybe you'd have one of these stranger mnemonics. Anyway, there are other colors. Pink is not a primary color, but it's a color we perceive. And so, Primary colors are, are correspond to light of a single color, like a laser. Okay, lasers emit light of a particular wavelength we perceive as a particular primary color. But you can mix different colors together in different ways. Again, if you mix all of them, you get white. You mix different combinations and different intensities, you get purple, magenta, uh, periwinkle, all these colors that I don't know what the hell they are in these clothes catalogs, sea foam. Um, <laughs> I prefer sage. Okay. Um, and the way these dispersive elements, I don't want to get into physics of prism so much, um, but the angles of the dispersions aren't right here. This is an example of what uh, light actually does as it moves through a prism. So uh, you get red on top, blue on the bottom, the other rainbow primary colors in between. Um, uh, at angles kind of like this. So anyway, uh, again, try to find ways of taking something complicated and relating it to something that people might, might know something about or have thought about or find a little bit more interesting. I think a, a useful thing for science fiction writers is the reason that we see a limited portion of the spectrum is because the different wavelengths uh, refract different, they, they bend different amounts going through a lens. So if you can see the blue in focus uh, on your retina, then the red, for instance, it, it has to be limited because it can't all be in focus through the same lens on your retina. It can, the same point, it exactly. can in a telescope, but you have to make very complicated lenses. Yeah. But this is indeed a problem. Uh, we call it uh, achromatic aberration. All the colors don't focus at the same point. And it causes problems for us with our instruments. Sometimes you set up using a camera in the red, but your instrument's also sensitive to blue light, and the blue light follows a slightly different path, and you lose some of it. And we have to correct for that. It's a leading cause of rejection for stock photography, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeremy will give us our photographer's perspective uh, today. I mean, in some ways, uh, I'm a very specialized photographer. Extremely specialized technical photographer. I have camera envy. What's that? I have camera envy of your camera. <laughs> I, I have well, used I, some I very impressive cameras. Places, so. Okay. <laughs> Light is a wave. The wavelengths are very, very small for light. And we tend to use either nanometers or angstroms. Nanometer is uh, one billionth of a meter, 10 to the minus 9 meters. Astronomers are cranky for historical reasons. I'm not sure exactly why we adopted angstroms rather than nanometers. Physicists tend to use nanometers. Astronomers tend to use angstroms. An angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. 10 to the minus 10 meters. And you use that A with the funny hat. And when we write our papers, we have to go find the special character to denote angstroms. And when we're lazy, we just use an A and everybody understands. But angstrom. And the part of the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light you can see, has wavelengths between approximately 4,000 and 7,000 angstroms. 4,000 is blue or violet type light. 7,000 angstroms is uh, red light. Some people can see a little bit beyond this one way or the other. Some people maybe a little less. And there are animals that can see beyond this. Long, longer wavelengths, lower energies, uh, 7,000 angstroms. And I'm going to be hitting all these topics over and over again, the relationships between frequency, 
wavelength, energy. We haven't got to energy yet, but we will very shortly. Um, this shows up a lot better in the computer. It's a little washed out here. But uh, I'll, I'll talk through this slide. So here we have our Roy G. Biv spectrum going backwards. Red over here, violet over here. 700 nanometers here, 7,000 angstroms. 400 nanometers here, uh, 4,000 angstroms. And this little part of the visible light is sandwiched between uh, light that has longer and shorter wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths, we first come to the ultraviolet. Sometimes the naming systems are clear and intuitive. Sometimes astronomers come up with clever things like type 1 and type 2. Uh, we go from the violet to the ultraviolet. That makes sense to me. So uh, I know some animals like bees can see into the ultraviolet a little bit. And if you go to even shorter wavelengths, we get into the x-rays. So the x-rays have only been known for a uh, little over a century, found accidentally, and uh, have been a very important tool in medicine. You can keep going higher energies, shorter wavelengths, to gamma rays. So uh, Bruce Banner discovered gamma rays in 1962. Um, and we don't have anything beyond gamma rays. So uh, as you keep cranking to arbitrarily shorter and shorter wavelengths, those are just very extreme gamma rays. Now, going the other way, we go from red light to infrared light, longer wavelengths, just beyond where you can perceive with the human eye. Everyday example of infrared light, probably all of you use it every day or close to every day, remote control devices for TVs, stereos, they have that little LED at the back, or at the, the front, you press the button, channel changes, you don't see anything. If you have the right piece of equipment, I have a set of night vision goggles over here that operate in the near infrared. You see that light popping on. So when uh, my remote control stops working and I fiddle with the batteries, change the batteries, and it still doesn't work, I can take out my night vision goggles. <laughs> I've done this. And see if the infrared light's going off. And, uh, and it works. And I'm like, OK, uh, the light's going off. There's a different problem. The light is going off. The light's out. My brother discovered quite by accident that the viewfinder on his digital camera actually shows the infrared light from his mm. remote controls. So you don't even need the fancy goggles. A, a lot of digital cameras, a, wider response. a lot of Actually, digital cameras filter. have wider responses, yes. They have a filter that prevents them from taking um, pictures into the infrared. You can actually have those filters removed. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty popular area of photography to shoot so-called infrared photography. It turns everything green, white, but colors like blue are maintained. So you can take a picture of a forest and it looks really ethereal and weird. If you go on Flickr and look for infrared photography, you'll find some amazing examples. Um, and I was going to also say, anecdotally, I think some animals can see into the near infrared too, because I was doing yes. uh, infrared uh, sensor research in uh, wetland habitats. And we have dozens and dozens of pictures of raccoons doing finger paints in, uh, in the trigger uh, beam. I think they could see it and we're just playing with it. Wow. Yeah, and I, I think if we're talking in terms of science fiction, this is incredibly interesting to think about biological senses. Um, we perceive light because of our eyes and our brains, how we interpret what we see. But at some level, it's, it's, a little, it's not completely arbitrary. There's a reason we see in the visible part of the spectrum. And I'll explain one, one reason for that. But there's no reason you can't exploit other parts of the spectrum like some animals do. There are animals that have sensors that work at extremely different ways, different parts of the spectrum, and pick up other properties of light, like polarization, for instance. Going on from the infrared, we get into microwaves. So microwave ovens are sort of a simple example of, of this. You can't see them, 
if you could had eyes that worked in the microwave part of the spectrum, you turn on your microwave oven, you would see this big glow coming out of it. It'd be kind of cool. Well, hopefully you wouldn't see too much of a glow coming out of it. Yes. Hopefully it wouldn't, but if you, you would see the heat coming out of it anyway from uh, the, the thermal part of the infrared. We'll, we'll talk about this in, in a minute. And as you keep going beyond microwaves to longer and longer wavelengths, out to wavelengths of meters, or even hundreds of meters, these are radio waves. So radio is something we all have had uh, our entire lives, and there's a lot of misconceptions that radio is somehow very different than light. It's something we listen to. So it comes to us at the speed of sound. I, I remember a disc jockey when I was a kid uh, making this mistake. Coming to you at the speed of sound, <laughs> and then trying to explain like George Lucas might. Well, yeah, it comes to the speed of light to your car, but from the speaker to your ear, it's the speed of sound. That's what I meant all along. So we have this entire giant range of uh, wavelengths. Um, you can't read what the wavelengths are over here, but in meters, uh, this goes from 10 to the minus 12, one trillionth of a meter wavelength, gamma rays. Uh, this is 10 to the 4 meters, okay, 10,000 meters uh, for extremely uh, long wavelength radio waves. And the visible light is just this one little bit in the middle. Now, something that's critical for astronomers, it has some relationships to uh, biology, evolution, and so forth is the fact that light doesn't go through the atmosphere in the same way for all wavelengths. Now, atmosphere is pretty transparent. We can all see each other quite well. But you probably know, especially those of you who live in uh, California or Seattle, places where you've got distant mountains and some uh, smoggy days or hazy, rainy days, sometimes the mountain's there and sometimes it's not because atmosphere is only mostly transparent to even visible light. If you take enough of it, uh, you have problems seeing uh, through it completely. What about uh, on the ocean? Sometimes when you look out, there's no horizon line. There are a lot of these sort of effects, uh, and astronomers have to deal with essentially all of them uh, because we don't anymore. We can put spacecraft up in orbit, and that helps. But uh, we have to look through the atmosphere. We have to understand all these effects in order to have uh, the best observations and really understand the light that's coming to us from distant objects. But we have what we call a visual window. Uh, the lower portion of this plot describes how opaque the atmosphere is as a function of wavelength. So it's not very opaque. It's pretty transparent to visible light. That's why we see stars. We see visible light, our eyes can detect, from the stars that comes down through the atmosphere. We also have radio astronomy. You've probably seen pictures from the movie Contact or other uh, venues of these big radio dishes. We know we communicate with satellites via radio. Radio waves go through the atmosphere pretty well, too. Now, there are some regions of the infrared where a lot of the light gets through, but not too much. Uh, primarily water vapor, CO2, things like this absorb in the infrared part of the spectrum. This is greenhouse gases. This is how they work. Visible light comes in. Uh, infrared light from sources here on the Earth are absorbed by these gases in the atmosphere and can't radiate back out to space very effectively. Um, Far infrared and the microwaves, very hard to observe from the ground. Likewise, ultraviolet, we have the ozone layer that uh, prevents us from getting sunburned, mostly. Also prevents astronomers from looking at the ultraviolet from our telescopes here on the ground. X-rays, gamma rays also don't go through the atmosphere very well. You may have heard stories about gamma ray telescopes 
that people set up on the ground. And that's true. But they don't observe gamma rays. They observe secondary particle showers from interactions between gamma rays and gases in the upper atmosphere, for instance. Okay, let's uh, continue. Question? Yes. About terminology, why is it infrared but ultraviolet? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Well, infra well, means speed. below and ultra means above. Do they? Yes, they do. Okay. <laughs> Since you asked, we talk about the infrastructure of a building. For instance, the inside structure. I mean, they're there, but that's what they are. Prefix is below and above. So it does. So below the red and above the violet is if you look at the spectrum as a vertical column. That makes sense. It does make sense. So uh, Ultraman lords it over Inframan, I guess. <laughs> Ultraman lords it over Inframan. Totally, totally. <laughs> yes, Jeremy. So I'm, I'm curious if um, the biological mechanism that dictates uh, what light, if it's tied to the size of the perceiving uh, biological mechanisms. You talk about the size of a wavelength. Um, for like an organism to see radio waves, would it need to be meters wide? or? There, there is a relationship, and we'll, we'll get to what some of those are okay. uh, in some, some later slides, because they're relevant, because we have to build the right kind of telescopes, the right kind of sizes in order to, uh, to operate. And there is a relationship between the instruments we build and the wavelength of light we're studying that is related to the physical size. It's a little more complicated than just uh, small things, big things. Okay, light is particles. Um, one of Einstein's many legacies in physics was making uh, the case that, uh, yes, we have lots of experiments that show light as a wave. There are other experiments that show light can be treated as a particle. We call those particles photons. You have light waves, electromagnetic waves. You can also say photons for sort of a discrete single entity, a single particle of light. And we have an energy E associated with a photon. And the energy is just proportional to the frequency. In fact, it's the frequency times Planck's constant, which is this ugly, ugly number over here. 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So this will be on your post test, uh, so remember this for Monday. But this is the kind of number that an astrophysicist memorizes. You use it all the time. You want to know what is the energy of a particular photon, of a particular wavelength or frequency? Because atoms interact with single photons and in very specific ways, depending on the energy of that photon. It can do certain things if it's the right energy, and it can't do those things if it's the wrong energy. And this is the relationship. Now. Yeah. <laughs> and not like three times ten to the ten. And the thing is, another little dirty secret between physicists and astronomers: uh, astronomers don't really like to use joules, which is an energy unit. Um, we like to use ergs. And so there's a relationship between joules and ergs, but this, this number becomes different. So then you wind up wanting to memorize either two numbers or conversion factors. So it's sort of a pain. You have to remember the units on Planck's constants, joules seconds, joules per second. No, no, it's joules seconds in physicist units. And then if we want to use astronomer units, it's a detail. So we both use the metric systems, but physicists like meters kilograms, seconds, astronomers like centimeters, uh, grams, seconds. I don't know why. We like angstroms too, we don't like nanometers. I don't know why. Okay, now it's important to understand that the energy of a photon does not depend on the intensity of the light. You can have, let's say, talk about lasers. You can have a very intense red laser and you can have a, a weak, a low batteries, uh, a weak red laser. So you can tell, oh yeah, that one's a lot brighter than, than that one. But they're all, they're both putting out photons of red light with the same frequency, same wavelength, same energy. 
One of them's putting out more photons. And that's the one that looks more intense. So here's an example, everyday life example of why energy per photon is important. As I said, if you have a certain amount of energy, you can do things. If you don't have that much energy, you can't do things. Ultraviolet light has enough energy to cause damage to your skin and cause uh, suntan, skin cancer, and so forth. But uh, you just dial down the energy into a blue light, green light, and uh, it doesn't do any damage to your skin. You can have a very intense green light on your skin and it won't cause any sunburn at all. But a relatively mild uh, light putting out ultraviolet will cause damage. So uh, another example I, I've used in the past sometimes, uh, hailstones. They, they come down and they bounce around. They get to a certain size, they start damaging cars. But if they're not that big, it doesn't matter, it doesn't do any damage. So again, that's why specific energy per photon is important in some contexts, not just how much light you see, but the energy or wavelength of that light. So why is there this um, misbelief that, that cell phones may cause brain cancer? I mean, the wavelengths that they'd be emitting are basically radio waves, so they're longer wavelengths. We know that those generally don't cause chemical changes. Do you, do you know anything about why? From, from the it? point of view of a physicist or astronomer, we would say, yeah, this kind of radiation does no damage biologically, but we're not biologists, and we don't know all the causes of, of interactions. So what I would say is you, you need to do the right biological studies to prove whether or not there's a real effect. Um, I remember some heated letters in Physics Today about 10 years ago with uh, very detailed calculations about the intensity uh, of the, uh, the radiation and the wavelengths of the radiation associated with cell phones and how it can't have any effect, but not my specialty. Okay, something that's intimately related to light uh, in a lot of ways is temperature and heat. And we need to understand these concepts too. But uh, thermal energy, the energy associated with, with heat, um, has to do with what we call the kinetic energy of moving atoms and molecules. In other words, the energy of motion. How fast are these little suckers moving around? Even if they're in a solid, they're still going to be bouncing around against each other. It's maybe easier to think of a gas or a liquid where things can move around a little bit more. But basically, how fast they're moving has to do with their kinetic energy and, in turn, their temperature. So, hot materials, everything's moving faster, they have more energy, and uh, that can help driving chemical reactions, nuclear reactions when you get to high enough temperatures. Um, things that affect uh, planetary astronomy, like uh, escape of gases from the upper atmosphere. And what's critical to the astronomer is creation of light. You can uh, have collisions between the atoms and molecules in the substance, again, driven by this kinetic energy that they have be by virtue of their temperature. And you share the energy between the atoms and molecules. And one of the ways that uh, some object, some, some atom, some molecule, when it gets bumped, it gets a lot of energy. It can give it back by bumping into something else and sharing that energy right away, but it can also emit a photon and get rid of some of the energy in that way. And this happens all the time. And we'll get to that in just a moment, but I want to talk about temperature scales, temperature units. These are not very well understood and are central to uh, these issues. Yeah. Um, just backing up a little bit for your last slide, there was something there about hot material has more energy available for the escape of gases from the atmosphere. Yes. Is that saying that if you heat the air, say, in the space shuttle, then you have to work harder to seal it so that it won't escape? No. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Escape against gravity. Okay. Oh, 
it's it's the issue. Uh, the issue is one of whether or not an object can hold an atmosphere and what kind of atmosphere. It depends on both the uh, escape velocity from that surface and the temperature of the atmosphere. That's why something like the moon has no significant atmosphere, but similar sized bodies in the outer solar system like uh, Titan has quite an atmosphere. It's much colder and it's easier for it to hold that atmosphere. Okay, so people in the United States are very familiar with Fahrenheit scales. Uh, they're familiar with Celsius, but uh, don't like to use it. And frankly, I'm down in Brazil. I see all the temperatures in uh, Celsius, and I have to do a mental conversion to decide if I'm hot or cold. <laughs> You're probably hot if it's Brazil. I'm in southern Brazil, and it's winter right uh, now. So well, I'm not physically in southern Brazil at the moment, but get my meaning. Quantally entangled with something that isn't southern Brazil. Yes. Um, so Celsius scale uh, and Fahrenheit scale also are, are based on freezing and boiling points of water. I guess the Fahrenheit scale technically isn't, uh, but uh, the Celsius scale, uh, zero degrees Celsius, freezing point of water, uh, 100 degrees Celsius, boiling point of water at sea level. So you just take those two temperatures, divide everything up in between into 100 degrees Celsius, and you can extrapolate higher and lower uh, temperatures. Now, experimentally, we've determined you reach zero energy, zero kinetic energy, these little particles, at absolute zero, which we can't ever quite reach because we can't ever quite get everything to stop moving. But we can get within um, something like a millionth of a degree Celsius of, of that absolute zero. It's uh, minus, and it's unfortunate, the slide minus is over there, minus 273 degrees Celsius, minus 459.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we commonly do is redefine our temperature scale starting at absolute zero, using Celsius degrees up from absolute zero, and calling this uh, Kelvin. So instead of a Celsius scale, it's a Kelvin scale using Celsius degrees, but we start at absolute zero. Now, the nice thing about this is that the energy you have available is proportional now to the degrees Kelvin of your system. Problem with using Celsius or Fahrenheit, something at zero degrees Celsius still has a lot of thermal energy. You may not think it's very warm, but it's warm compared to absolute zero. And what does it mean to have negative temperatures? Those things still have still have energy, still have all the particles moving around. So uh, physicists, astronomers, we redefine zero at absolute zero and use the Celsius scale, and then we refer to our temperatures in degrees Kelvin. So 273 degrees Kelvin, freezing point of water, 373 boiling point of water, room temperature, it's about 300, 300 Kelvin here. Quite pleasant. Okay. How much was that? Uh, what did you say? Could you, the last one? Room temperature. Three, room temperature, approximately 300 degrees Kelvin. Quite comfortable. Now, I always hated this term, black body radiation, but this is so central to understanding so much in astronomy. I call it Planck black body radiation. Planck was one of these German scientists. We already had Planck's constant to help us describe the energy of a photon. And uh, Planck's constant came out of trying to understand this thing called black body radiation. Now, all black body radiation really is, is the light that objects emit by virtue of being warm and having thermal energy. All of us are glowing in the infrared right now. Everything in this room is glowing in the infrared right now. And it, we're glowing with a spectrum more or less like uh, what we call a black body. Technically, a black body is something that perfectly absorbs in every, all the light that, that hits it. It comes to this one uniform temperature. And then it puts out this, this perfect spectrum. Um, 
by virtue of all these little collisions and all these little atomic transitions, molecular and atomic transitions. Um, and the energy of the light that comes off depends on what kind of collisions, what kind of bumping, and what kind of kinetic energy the particles have. So it depends on the heat, the temperature of the object. So this gets a lot more complicated when in reality, because we don't have perfect black bodies, things that perfectly absorb, you reflect some wavelengths, you absorb others better. Um, but uh, if you just sort of think of this term as a term that describes the light put off by bodies by virtue of their having a temperature, I, I think that's a good way of thinking about what a black body is. So people already have common everyday experiences with black body radiation. Okay? Irons, stovetops. They start to glow red when they get hot. They get really hot, they get brighter. And maybe they get a little less red, maybe they get to uh, looking uh, a little yellower. And our uh, light bulbs glow, put off light by virtue of heating that tungsten filament to very high temperatures, like 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And it puts off black body radiation. So there's a few simple things, maybe two qualitative things to understand about this process. One, the hotter the material, the more energy it has, and the more light it emits. Second, the hotter material, the more energy it has, the higher energy the photons it emits. So it's going to emit the higher energy photons. Blue photons have more energy than red photons. So when you start turning on your stove, first it's going to glow in the infrared. It gets hotter, glow in the red. If you could make it hot enough, it would glow blue. No. Um, one of the properties of this radiation is that it's always going to put off uh, more and more light at all wavelengths as you heat it up. But it will preferentially put more of its energy into higher energy photons. But it's always going to put out more and more in the, uh, in the uh, visible light too. But you can get something, puts out most of its energy into the ultraviolet. But it still will continue to put out energy in uh, longer wavelength lights, visible infrared light. Okay. This gets a little complicated. Let me, let's go to some real examples of what this looks like. Yeah, some of these are being washed out. This is, uh, I don't know how much to blame the projector. Um, We can try. Uh, Pat, could you uh, take out one more bank of uh, lights, maybe the middle switch? Okay, let's see what happens. That's it's, better. Better. it's a little better? Our diagram is just... It's too yeah, it, uh, there's, there's a problem with the focusing yeah, on the... There's uh, definitely a problem, because the plank and formula should be the same thing on the whole left side. Yeah. Okay, maybe I should put all the fine lettering. Uh, let's, let's get the back lights, at least. Um, it's common with cool lab screens when you have that problem. Yeah. Well, you know, just one angstrom. They don't have It would if we were dealing with x-rays. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll have to just talk a little bit more. These slides are all online, and I will send a link around to them, so you can go back and uh, see them much more clearly on your computers. So uh, Planck derived a formula that gives the intensity of light at each wavelength as a function of the temperature of, of our radiating body. And what we have here are three black body spectra of objects at three different temperatures. 
The one at the bottom here is at 5,000 degrees Kelvin, so this is quite a lot hotter than room temperature here. These are star-like temperatures. And this is where uh, the application to astronomy is most readily apparent is understanding stars. Uh, 6,000 degrees Kelvin and 7,000 degrees Kelvin. And these are all on the same scales. So as you increase the temperature from 5,000 to 7,000 degrees Kelvin, you see this, uh, the radiation emitted increases quite dramatically. And moreover, you notice that the peak is shifting from long wavelengths to shorter wavelengths, from uh, red light, orange light here at the cooler object to blue light here in the hotter object. And so this is ultraviolet light here, infrared light here, and our visible spectrum marked with our rainbow colors. Now, yes, question. This is just indicating the uh, peak, uh, the wavelength at which the light intensity peaks. Now, uh, Planck's formula is very complicated. And uh, sometimes you need to use the complicated version. A lot of times, for conceptual understanding, um, there are two very simple laws that tell us how black body spectra behave, how they depend on temperature. The first is something called Wien's law. And it describes how to figure out what this wavelength is where most of the light comes out as a function of temperature. So the wavelength at which this maximum light intensity occurs is equal to this number in various units divided by the temperature. So the important thing is here that it's inversely proportional to the temperature. As you increase the temperature, this wavelength gets smaller. So as you get hotter and hotter objects, the wavelength becomes smaller, and more and more light is put out into higher and higher energy photons, because photons with short wavelengths have higher energy. So there are different units here. Um, it's convenient to use this form uh, 3,000 micron kelvins uh, in Wien's law for room temperature because if we have 300 degrees at room temperature, 3,000 divided by 300, can you do that in your head? <laughs> 10. And the degrees kelvin cancel out and you're left with microns here. So micron is also known as a micrometer. It's one millionth of a meter. It's a wavelength. And so room temperature corresponds to a peak black body wavelength of about 10 microns. So we radiate strongly at 10 microns, which is infrared radiation. If you want to deal with wavelengths in nanometers, you can use this version where you've got uh, 3 million up here in the constant. So that describes sort of the color of the black body radiation, where the energy is coming out most strongly. There's another law down here, Stefan Boltzmann law. And we'll see if Jeremy thinks this is an ugly constant or not. The uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 joules per square meter per second per Kelvin to the minus 4. <laughs> this is not complicated because the equation is just that the energy radiated by a black body per unit surface area is equal to this ugly constant times temperature to the fourth power. The important thing to, re to understand here is that the energy radiated by a black body depends on how big it is, its radiating surface, and its temperature to the fourth power. That's why you increase the temperature by a small percentage and you get a big extra excess of energy coming out. 
It's not a linear relationship. If you doubled the temperature of, say, a, a cannonball radiating in the infrared, if you doubled the temperature, how much more uh, light energy would come out of that cannonball? 16 times, two to the fourth power, 16. You double the temperature, you multiply the uh, light output by a factor of 16. So the amount of radiation put out by bodies by virtue of their temperature is very sensitive to what that temperature is. And this is what lets them cool off radiatively by emitting this black body radiation. So you might have an intuitive sense that hot things cool off very rapidly, cooler things not so much. It's more complicated, of course, but in part it's because of this effect. So here on Earth, there's also convection with air moving around. Your cannonball might be in contact with uh, a nice heat conductor or something like that. But objects in space, for instance, this is, uh, this is how things cool off. They radiate light. And it's sometimes important to realize people think of space as being cold. Well, there are environments in space where it's very, very warm and it's hard to cool off. So uh, overheating can be a problem in the space environment the same way as uh, freezing can. That's a more complicated issue. But these two laws let you understand intuitively how this black body radiation works. At least I, I hope they do. And if you need to do something very specific, they let you calculate something a little bit more specific than having to guess at it. OK. So we did this example already, room temperature 300 degrees Kelvin. Put that into Wien's law. Divide 3,000 by 300, get 10 microns. And this wavelength is about 20 times longer than what your eye can see but the thermal camera we'll be looking at later and what you may have seen on TV or in TV shows or movies like Predator operates at 7 to 14 microns. So it's very sensitive to objects sort of at temperatures like the surface of the Earth. Now, we can also estimate immediately the temperature of our own sun. We can take a spectrum of the sun and we can determine uh, the wavelength of light that, that the sun puts out primarily. And that's approximately half a micron, or 5,000 angstroms. Peaks about at the green wavelengths. So we put this into Wien's law again. Now we divide 3,000 by 0.5 microns, half a micron, for where the uh, sun has the most intense light. And we come up with the number 6,000 degrees Kelvin. The surface of the sun, approximately, is 6,000 degrees Kelvin. It's a little closer to 5,800. But just from understanding black bodies in the laboratory, we can immediately understand the temperature of the sun. It is more complicated than that, but this is the fundamental physics governing radiation from the sun. It glows because it's hot. And we can determine the temperature just by looking at the light coming to us. I think that's pretty cool. There are some other qualitative laws out there that describe how uh, matter interacts with light. Uh, Kirchhoff's laws. So hot solids, tables, people, emit a continuous spectrum, a black body. Now, hot gases can also emit black bodies, especially if the gas is very dense. Um, we see the sun, which is, which is hot gas, emitting a black body. But it gets modified because gases can also emit at discrete wavelengths. You can get gases to act like lasers, for instance. And uh, actually, we see, we don't see lasers, but we see masers, the microwave equivalent to lasers. We see these in distant galaxies. We see masers happening in space spontaneously, and that's kind of cool. 
Now, uh, colder gases can also absorb discrete wavelengths of light. We call those absorption lines when we see them. Emission lines, absorption lines. And these can be superimposed upon a continuous spectrum created by a black body or some other process. So okay. That's the principle behind a gas chromatograph, basically. Yes. I'm going to skip this, I think, uh, except just to make the point that these discrete emission lines, absorption lines that correspond to one very specific color, well, they're different for different elements and molecules, different atoms, different types of atoms and molecules. Hydrogen will have a different emission line spectrum than neon. Uh, people already know this. They see a neon sign. It's got a particular color to it, corresponds to that gas. But if you change that gas uh, to helium, you get different colors out. To hydrogen, different colors, and so forth. Does this account for sunspots? For no, sunspots are a very different phenomenon. Oh, okay. So when you're looking at an, an image of the sun um, and you see the modeledness of it, that's the different gases absorbing at different wavelengths? Or sun now, wavelengths. sunspots are different temperatures. Oh. Oh, okay. So cool we, uh, they're cooler than the rest of the sun, and so they look darker. They're still quite hot and putting out a lot of energy, mm -hmm. but I think sunspots are 4,000, 4,500 degrees Kelvin rather than mm -hmm. 6,000 degrees like the rest of the sun. So we, we just saw that the radiation output depends on the temperature to the fourth power. So they're down maybe 25, 20% cooler than the surroundings, but they look a lot darker. Okay, so the important thing here is when an astronomer can take a spectrum of an object and see these discrete emission or absorption lines, we can tell you which elements are producing them. We can tell you that's oxygen in space. That's hydrogen. That's helium. That's formaldehyde. Every element, every molecule has very uh, specific wavelengths of light that it will emit and absorb. And by measuring the wavelengths of light we see in these discrete features in the spectrum, we can tell you exactly what we're looking at. We can tell you what the sun is made out of. It's mostly hydrogen and helium, but we can tell you how much iron, how much calcium, how much argon, uh, how much of a whole assortment of these atomic gases. Can you say what you mean by how much? Um, the ratios of all those gases. Yes, you measure how much light is absorbed or emitted uh, and the relative strengths of those features of all the different gases. And we know how readily those individual elements or, or atoms will interact with the light. And we can use our understanding of physics to determine those ratios. Okay. So it's like on a, like a reading gas chromatograph, it's, it's, like a, it's like an axis. You've got peaks and valleys. And the position on the y axis is telling um, what it is and then is how the gas chromatographs work in a different way. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. I don't use gas chromatographs. Um, there are mass spectrographs that work in a very different way. Um, I'm not positive exactly how the gas chromatographs work, I guess I should say. Do you know? No. Uh, <laughs> I was going in a different direction. You were talking about identifying elements by a particular emission. My understanding was you have to look at a set of emissions and it's the spacing between multiple emissions that identifies an atom or a molecule. Yeah. A single emission is going to be shifted with uh, how the object is moving. What you do is you, you correct for that motion always. Um, but very often it's the case you can't look at one uh, absorption line, for instance, and figure out how much you have. But if you have enough uh, absorption lines from different parts of the spectrum, you can use all that information to get a very good determination of what you're looking at and how much of it's there. Okay, just to make certain I understand. Um, for hydrogen, for example, I believe it's the Balmer line series. You have to see multiple lines with a certain relative spacing, and that's how you know it's hydrogen. Yes. It's not any single line. Right. Sometimes you have some ambiguity because uh, 
we haven't talked about the Doppler effect, but as objects move around in space, the wavelengths can be shifted. Uh, same way, when you listen to a train coming towards you, the, the wavelengths of sound uh, get shifted to either higher or lower frequencies. Um, so if you really want to be sure what you're looking at, you need to determine what this motion is, what this Doppler shift is, and you want to look at multiple lines to be able to do that accurately. Okay, well, let me move on. This is a little technical. Here's, here's your Balmer series now. Um, if you look at hydrogen gas absorbing uh, some light, when we look in the visible part of the spectrum, we see three absorption lines from hydrogen gas. These are, it's called the Balmer series. Red light, there's absorption from the first uh, Balmer line, hydrogen alpha, we call it, or Balmer alpha, usually just hydrogen alpha. H beta, for short, is blue light. H gamma is uh, violet light. And generally speaking, if you see absorption from one of these, you should see absorption from all of these, the whole series, because this corresponds to transitions of uh, an atomic state, all from the same uh, initial atomic state. And from a different atomic state, you get another series of lines in the infrared, passion and bracket series. And for hydrogen, uh, out of uh, the ground state of hydrogen, you get a Lyman series in the ultraviolet, whole series of these absorption lines. So uh, this is starting to get very technical and abstract in some sense. Uh, but uh, the important thing to understand is when we take a spectrum of light from some distant object, we see these absorption lines. Sometimes we see emission lines. And this lets us figure out the uh, chemical makeup of the stuff we're looking at. We don't have to guess what it is. We can measure what it is, even though we're just seeing light. We can measure how hot it is and what it is and know its physical conditions, even though it's maybe millions of light years away and we can't physically go there. <coughs> 